right, everybody, it's video number two, and uh, yeah, so this video, I just did my book review for Emil Zola's The Debacle, but this video I wanted to do uh, to go over my two be read books for uh, probably the next two months or so, so that'd be uh, June and July, or probably late June and July, but uh, yeah, just start off by showing you some of the recent books I've read, just giving my first impressions of them, so I can just go back and reference them when I'm doing the reviews, just to see how they've held up, and uh, See if I'm pleasantly surprised or disappointed or any of the manner in between those two reactions. So the first book we have up here is uh, William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Uh, yeah, I've been meaning to, to stick my toes back into Faulkner for some time. I read uh, in high school, uh, Light in August, uh, in my junior AP Lit course that I took. And uh, if I remember correctly, I quite liked some elements of that book, and I really liked the, the, the prose in it, and um, I just was, uh, I mean, I was living in Texas at that point, and I think I didn't have enough distance from the South in order to appreciate, you know, a literary portrait of Southern life and Southern literature. I mean, because I was living it, you know, I was like, I don't want to read William Faulkner, it's about Mississippi. No, thank you. But uh, now that I've I've been away from the South and there's some distance between me and my life previous to the, when I was living there. Um, you know, I, the sort of romantic aspirations kind of creep in and I think I can truly appreciate, I think, a wonderful literary portrait of uh, the sort of fetid Southern Gothic underbelly. And um, I picked up As I Lay Dying because I was watching uh, Recently, it was that Cliff Sargent who does the book bit and food guy, you know, the, the big honcho with 100,000 subscribers, uh, uh, was talking about this book and saying that this is probably the most Faulkner that you can get for your, you know, the, the biggest bang for your buck. And I don't think it's as complex, narrative speaking, as opposed to like Absalon, Absalon, and uh, The Sound and the Fury, which I think is, is probably conceptually his most daunting work so I wanted to sort of stick my toes back into something that was a bit you know a bit more uh, easier to manage in terms of when you're getting into literary modernism you can kind of lose yourself and get in over your head quite quickly with a lot of the modernist writers so um yeah I'm excited to see how my impression of William Faulkner has shifted since my junior year of high school when I was you know, practically illiterate, you know, in terms of the books that I was exposed to at that point and uh, my own artistic sensibilities and just where I am at and my personal life is just so much markedly different than when I was then, a sort of scruffy looking antisocial, uh, closeted bisexual in uh, high school in Texas. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how William Faulkner stacks up. But I expect really good things from this. Uh, Clifford's review, which I'll link below, just got me really excited to read this. Just this sort of sham, you know, it's about, you know, this funeral procession going through rural Mississippi and the sort of hell that they encounter, you know, it's sort of like this, you know, homeric kind of ballad. So that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I hope it lives up to those expectations. But yeah, I'll link his review below. But yeah, that's William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, a classic modernist. American classic. So I think that'll be, I probably want to read that one as soon as I can. But uh, the next one up is The Ministry of Pain by, uh, I think I pronounce it Dabraka Ugerzrik. Ha ha ha, Dabraka, I can't, I can't pronounce her name, but uh, she is a Yugoslavian writer. I forget what republic of the Yugoslavia she was from. I want to say Croatian, but I could be wrong about that. I don't think she's Bosnian, but again, I could be wrong, yeah. But yeah, there's a big difference, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, I couldn't tell if he was an Israeli or a Palestinian. <laughs> there's a big difference between are you a Bosnian or a Serbian, you know, in terms of your political outlook, for instance, but, um, and cultural outlook, you know. But uh, this is about a expat writer who, uh, an academic who's teaching a bunch of expat students in the former Yugoslavia and Amsterdam and uh, if I'm reading the back here, they all work at this sort of S&M clothing fetish shop called The Ministry. And uh, yeah, this is just, I don't really know too much about this writer or this, uh, or this book, but yeah, I was just sort of reading sections of it at the bookstore that I picked it up at Henderson's in Bellingham. And it uh, looked like a marvelously raunchy 
and just very structurally and stylistically a very strange and engrossing look into political exile and in the Yugoslav conflict of the 90s and in the sort of general kind of uh, malaise that sort of has infected Western Europe as opposed to like, you know, Eastern Europe where, you know, people had to live through, you know, genuinely kind of barbarous history for the past century and a half or whatever. So uh, I'm interested to see how this novel stacks up. And uh, yeah, I know this writer, she's known for also the essays that she also, in her nonfiction that she writes, there's a book called Thank You for Not Reading, which is a book of her essays that I really want to read as well. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. So hopefully this is a pleasant surprise because I don't really know what I'm going to be in store for this one. But again, that's The Ministry of Pain by Dabraka Ugrishek. <laughs> Please help me, God, <laughs> with pronunciation. The next one up is uh, sticking my toes back into genre fiction, which I normally do once a year, and then I go screaming away from it back into my literary confines that I usually inhabit. It's At the Mountains of Madness and other stories by H.B. Lovecraft. I haven't actually read that much Lovecraft. Uh, I just sort of skipped over all the genre fiction, to be honest with you. I mean, I was kind of like into Raymond Chandler for a time when I was just first getting into reading. And uh, some of the Lovecraft stuff, I've read another one of his compilations of uh, short stories. And uh, I was interested in Thomas Ligotti for a while, but I kind of just left all that shit behind when I was getting into literature and stuff that was more tactile for me and less sort of, um, yeah, I'm just not very into genre fictions, but I tend to try to get back into it every once in a while. Like, I'm really not much into science fiction. And... Uh, yeah, every year I try to sort of dip my toes back into it, and uh, every time I'm usually disappointed. But hopefully, H.P. Lovecraft is 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 a is a, is a pleasant break from what I'm from what I normally read. But yeah, at the Mountains of Madness, it's H.P. Lovecraft, cosmic horror, etc., etc. I think this is about some people that go on this expedition to the Antarctic to find some sort of lost alien city or whatever. So uh, hopefully it's pretty good. I'm, I'm just sort of interested in uh, uh, reapproaching Lovecraft. That's kind of why I picked this up. And uh, it was hard. It's hard to find his books in used bookstores. So uh, yeah, I just sort of snapped this up whenever I saw it. So uh, yeah, I, I think I picked this up when I was visiting some relatives in Texas at a bookstore there. Uh, so yeah, H.P. Lovecraft. Hopefully it gets me like jiving with genre fiction, but I fucking I doubt it. I'll probably have lots to say on that. Probably not so great judging from Lovecraft's own you know. We share the same birthday me and H.P. Lovecraft which is startling and not, it makes me uncomfortable kind of, but uh, yeah. He's a racist bastard. Ha ha ha. But yeah, okay, the next book up is Roland Barthes. So this is uh, about as far away as you can get from H.P. Lovecraft kind of. It's Cam Camera Lucidia, which is uh not really one of his more philosophic books. I think this is the last book that Roland Barth read. I've never read any Roland Barth, but uh, this one looked really cool because it was kind of, it's sort of a eulogy to his dead mother. It was also Roland Barth's last book before he died, and it's his meditation on the power of photography, particularly the power of photography on the individual observing it, so not on the photographer. And it's regarded with Susan Sontag's on photography as one of the uh, uh, creme de la creme sort of critical texts on uh, photography as a medium of art or one of the first major critical texts on the uh, 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 mechanisms inherent in the medium of photography and uh, yeah I'm really interested to uh, to look into this I kind of hope it's kind of like uh, the book form of like a Chris Marker documentary and uh, it was written around the same time as Sensibly because I think they're both, I think this was written in like 1980, and I think Sensuli also came out in 1980 or 79, so uh, yeah, it's sort of, uh, this is a wonderful, I'm sort of more intrigued these days of books that sort of can blend the lines between sort of memoir, fiction, non-fiction, philosophy, and traveling, and like a travelogue, like I'm really into like W.G. Sable, that's been one of my big literary finds of the past year or so, and uh, any books that can kind of like morph all these different genres and break down the barriers. I'm always interested in writers that can do that. And uh, I'm liking works that can incorporate more non-fictional elements into a fictional space. 
you know, because it gives you room to like play with it. I'm typically not big into historical fiction, but I'm starting to sort of get into the realm of like how people can like filter memoir elements into a fictional space and just imbue the fictional space with something that's very tactile and immediate, but it doesn't have to be as straight down the line as nonfiction, where you where you're like beholden to factual factual reality or whatever. But uh, yeah, I'm interested in Olin Barth, and uh, hopefully this gets me reading some more critical theory. Hopefully this is sort of my gateway back into critical theory for grad school, so hopefully this is a pleasant surprise. Alright, the next one we have up is The Leopard. Who is this by? Uh, Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa. I'm much better at pronouncing Italian than Spanish. <laughs> but uh, yes, this is The Leopard. Um, I believe this is the only book, only novel that was published by Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa. And I believe it was published uh, after his death. I think he died in 1957. I think it was published in 58. And uh, it's about like this uh, aging Sicilian monarch who, I think it's set in the mid 19th century about this aging Sicilian monarch trying to deal with like the onrush and the onset of modernity in his uh, 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 realm. And uh, I know that Lampedusa himself was also a Sicilian prince, or he comes from a line of Sicilian royalty and nobility, and this is, I've heard it's one of the, the best works of Italian fiction that was produced in the 20th century. So. I've heard really good things about this book. I don't really know too much about it other than that. So I'm looking for a very egalic, very luxurious, sort of opulent, melancholic kind of read for this one. And hopefully it delivers on all those fronts. And I've heard the writing, especially the prose, is fantastic in this. And uh, yeah, I'm not too familiar with uh, 20th century Italian literature, but I have another Italian writer here who I'll get to. It's, I think, from the same period, but it's more uh, along the lines of the Roland Barth book, which I was just talking about, books that can sort of blend fictional and non-fictional elements. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to The Leopard. Hopefully this again is another pleasant surprise. The next one up is, this was kind of a shot in the dark for me. I don't really know too much or anything about this writer, David Alambari. Uh, I know he's also a Yugoslavian writer, and this is called Sing, I think. I picked this up again at the same bookstore in Texas I was at just because whenever I see any books that are published by this Northwestern imprint, especially the ones that have the covers like this, just because they published Death and the Dervish and Misa, uh, Misa Selimovic's books, I kind of just scarf them up whenever I see them. And usually they're fairly good reads. Like That's how I got into, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, she's the writer, that she won the Nobel Prize, I think last year, two years ago. Olga, her last name starts with a T, I can't pronounce it, but she's Polish. And she did a wonderful book that was published by this imprint called House of Day, House of Night, which is another awesome novel. So uh, yeah, anytime I just see books that are published by this imprint, I just snatch them up just because they're usually, and it's books that are, it's writings from an unbound Europe, and this is the imprint from Northwestern University Press. And uh, yeah, these are just some marvelously fitted, really kind of dark, psychological Eastern European writing. And uh, yeah, I hope it, hope it lives up to these expectations. I don't know too much about David Alibari other than that. Uh, I know he's a Serbian writer, so um, yeah, I think this is about his exile in America and about dealing with his uh, dead father. So I can relate to that <laughs> on my own personal level. Uh, all right, uh, the next one we have up is, oh, this is Catlin Street by Magda Sabazo. If you've been following any of the reviews that I wrote the last two years for my year-end list, you will know the name Magda Sabazo. Two years ago, I think in 2019, her book, uh, Isa's Ballad, was my favorite book of the year. That book was a devastatingly, just amazing portrait of the relationship between uh, this woman and her aging mother who's going through, uh, like, I guess, early onset um, dementia and uh yeah just the fractured relationship that they have and uh Magna Sabuzo just writes these very intensely emotional very personal human stories between you know uh usually uh women um like 
women and their children or women in, 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 in these very sort of confined uh, uh, societal uh, uh, entrapments that are sort of forced upon people and uh, just the way in which he goes about exploring the psychological cartography of these people is just soul-wrenching you know she's just an incredibly amazing stylistic writer as well I mean just the way in which she writes her prose is just so sweeping and it, it literally sort of like just captivates you off like off your feet and uh, yeah her other novel Abigail was one of the favorite books that I read last year. And then her book, The Door, which I read three years ago, I think all the way back in 2017, was one of my favorite books from 2017. And uh, yeah, this is the other, I think this is, uh, yeah, another one of her books that's available in English translation called Catalan Street. I don't know too much about it. And uh, I think once I read this one, I'll have read everything that's been published by her into English so far. But I think there's some other ones that are coming. So hopefully, hopefully we get more because, uh, she is one of my favorite writers of all time, uh, Magda Zabazo. The fucking Hungarians. The Hungarian literary tradition, just given how small a country Hungary is, it's one of the most exciting for me. I mean, you have people like, uh, what's that guy's name? Laszlo Krasnohorkai, who works with Bellator. And uh, yeah, these are just amazing novelists and writers in that country. I don't know what it is, what they put in the water there, but goddamn, those motherfuckers can write. Especially going back even further like the early 20th century like before the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire they had some amazing literature that came from that part of the world it's just great stuff but yeah Magda Sabazo I'm really looking forward to Catlin Street hopefully it's another one of my favorites for the year next one up is another female writer a woman writer that I I have experienced before Clarice Lespector is near to the wild heart this is I believe her debut novel uh, which is gets compared, I believe, a lot to Ulysses by James Joyce. Lots of stream of consciousness, and yeah, Clary Lispector is a very incredibly awesome stylist. I mean, her prose is so exacting, and you know, it's like being, it's like being trapped in a fucking tornado of like psychological destruction. It's great. I mean, I've read a compilation, a really big ass compilation that compiled all of her short stories, and that was wonderful in stretches. I think that sometimes her writing does tend to grade on me in a way that like it can be like holy shit here we go. And it's like kind of reading like uh, Samuel Beckett you know. It, it can just become too overwhelming at points and it can become too uh, deviant from like the, the stylistic elements that I think you need to have to have a good piece of fiction. You know it can just become too heavy on the internal monologue and not enough in like the characterization or any of the other elements that make up a good piece of writing. But hopefully, this is going to be the first long form work I've read by Clarice Lispector. So hopefully, this is a pleasant surprise. I really need to read. Uh, I think Passions According to G H is the one that's like her best work, and I really want to read that one too. But uh, I couldn't pass this up. I was in a bookstore in Bellingham and uh, saw Clarice Lispector on the shelf, and it's like I gotta have it. I don't care what it is. So yeah, I'm looking forward to reading some more of her work. And uh, yeah, I wrote a paper over one of her short stories for one of my other undergrad critical theory classes. And that was one of my, my most cherished memories of writing a paper. It was one of the most rewarding experiences of writing a paper for my good friend Mark Lester in his class. He's actually, he's a neighbor of mine here in Sun Valley. But uh, yeah. All right, let's see, what's the next one we got? Uh, this is a compilation of short stories. This is the stories of Brees DJ Pancake, which is a strange name. A strange fellow. He, um, I just heard about this the other day. I forget who told me about this, but Brees DJ Pancake, I think, is one of the most uh, well-known but unknown, one of the most well-known unknown writers of American literature from the last half of the 20th century. He was from West Virginia. He published lots of short stories, I think, in the Atlantic Magazine in the late 70s, and I think he killed himself in 1979, I think in his mid-30s, but he taught at, I think, the University of West Virginia as, like, a, a, a creative writing professor, and, uh, yeah, his stories get compared a lot to, like, Cormac McCarthy or William Faulkner, and uh, they have this very earthen... I want to say pagan-like quality to them, and uh, 
just a very melancholic kind of look at like rural West Virginia and the people and places that he kind of inhabited. And it's infused with this sort of remarkable level of stylization, or so I'm told anyway. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. You know, I saw this on, you know, at another used bookstore on the shelf, and I was like, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, I was just reading about this book. I gotta have it. So, uh, yeah, stories of Reese DJ Pancake. Looking forward to this. Hopefully, this is another kind of gateway back in, a gateway for me back into American literature, especially from like, you know, rural America. You know, I'm not really too big on like American literature that recounts coastal America, you know, like New York or LA or whatever. Like, I don't really care. You know, it's like getting to like the rural heart of America that kind of like fed a underbelly for me is the interesting parts of our country anyway. But, uh, yeah. The next one up is Carlo Levy's Christ Stopped at Ebley. And this is, I think, kind of like a, a, a memoir come travelogue of the time that, uh, that Carlo Levy spent in, uh, this very, uh, dilapidated and poor region of uh, southern France. This is famously like the city in the area where Pasolini's The Christ, or no, The uh, Gospel According to St. Matthew was filmed. And I think on the cover here, that's that village where, uh, where, where a lot of that movie sort of takes place, where they use it as sort of a backdrop for Jerusalem for that movie. And yeah, it's this very, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why, this book is one of the reasons why Pasolini wanted to film it in that area, because of like the the sort of impoverished nature of like a lot of the people that lived in this area of Italy they didn't have access I mean it was literally like 300 years behind the rest of Italy I mean Carlo Levi I think wrote this this is about his time that he spent there during the 1930s I believe during uh, the late period of Mussolini's regime and uh, Carlo Levi was an anti-fascist activist and writer and he was kind of like in self-induced exile in this portion of the country I believe he was also a doctor and he was helping um, facilitate some humanitarian mission in this area of Italy and uh, this is I think I might be wrong about that but uh this is like his writings and his memoirs from the time he spent there around these sort of Italian peasant villages and this just looks like a very very enticing read I love sort of travel memoirs from that area in history and this sort of lost window that you get on uh, European life that was sort of disintegrated after the Second World War but yeah this looks like a very very enrapturing read. All right, we've got two more. The first, uh, next one up is this short story by Jean Giano. I think it's only like 40 pages long, called The Man Who Planted Trees. I don't know too much about this, but I've heard Jean Giano is a wonderfully awesome stylistic writer from uh, the mid 20th century in France. And uh, yeah, hopefully this is a pleasant surprise. Again, I don't know too much about what this is going to be about. I just heard it's been really good, so I saw it at a bookstore for like two bucks, so gotta have it. And then the last one up is The Snows of Yesteryear by, what is this guy's name, Gregor von Rizzori, who I believe is an Austrian novelist, and uh, I think this gets compared to like the works of W.G. Sable a lot. It has like lots of uh, his elements in it, like there's pictures in it, and again it kind of goes over this sort of lost area of uh, European culture and history that just sort of disintegrated after the Second World War about, uh, uh, I think it's like the Austrian aristocracy and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, just that sort of middle European world. But yeah, I don't really know too much about this. I've just heard that Gregor von Rizzori is a wonderful writer um, from that period in time in continental literature. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this one. I don't know what it's going to be about. So uh, yeah, I just kind of, I do kind of like picking books up on a whim because I'm usually pleasantly surprised with how I kind of like innately am able to find the shit I'm looking for without like putting my hand too much on the scale. That's kind of how I go about buying books. But uh, and a lot of all of these were put, uh, were bought at used bookstores, so I, I I try not to use Amazon as much as possible because I feel like with used bookstores, you know you kind of just get the choice in front of you, you know, you have to make a decision. With Amazon or with online retailers, you know, you, they frighten me because it's like, there's way too many options, what the fuck am I going to choose to read? It better be good or I'm going to like hate myself. But with used bookstores, it's like, it's here and I know I kind of want it, so why don't we just pick it up and take a gamble? And I, I'm always more pleasantly surprised with that way of thinking than uh, 
overthinking what I'm going to be reading. But um, yeah, those are the books for uh, <clears throat> probably the next two months or so. So uh, hopefully it's an invigorating summer of reading. But yes, that's that video, and I think that does it for me for this week. <laughs> Enough of me rambling on about books. <laughs> Have a great one.